new series in the little book of James, A Faith That Works. A Faith That Works. And last time when we, we talked about when troubles just won't go away. Our theme today is not when our troubles just won't go away, but our theme is when um, you're under pressure. Anybody ever felt like they're under a ton of pressure? <laughs> I should probably ask, who has it? And then we'd all accuse you of lying. <laughs> yeah, because we, we know what it's like when when pressure is on us, you see. Pressure actually comes from two directions. External, there's things in our lives that pressure us. I remember being a student and facing, uh, you know, midterm or final exams, and they all came at the same time. And, and so uh, you were pressured, and you, you'd pull the all-nighter, you know, in order to cram in the very last little bit of information you could to regurgitate that then onto the, the, the exam and hopefully hopefully passed, but that was pressure that was external, brought on us. And uh, we've all had that kind of external temptation. It's called a test or a trial. A test. I've been tested. A test or a trial. Well, there's also another direction. It's internal. And we're like a pressure cooker. That we have this uh, pressure from within that uh, is just a lot of pressure to go in a certain direction. We call that temptation. Uh, something external happens, like uh, somebody offers me a coffee. I have no internal temptation. I don't like coffee. <laughs> somebody offers me a Diet Coke, and I'm on that path. <laughs> I gravitate towards it. I shake it till I get it. You, you know what I'm saying? And, and so... There's the external and there's the internal. The internal temptation, that part in us that craves and wants and desires. And that's what I want to focus on today. We have these two. How do you handle temptation that is, that pressure that is within us? How to handle that? Well, the first thing that you do is you don't blame God. But I'm tempted to do that. He says, when tempted, and it's coming from within... Maybe there's some external stimuli, but it's coming from within. You're craving, you want that. No one should say, God is tempting me. That's the way James writes it. So don't blame it on God. But we're pretty good at blaming it on God. It goes all the way back to our parents, Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve in the garden, now God told them they could eat of all the trees in the garden, but there was a tree that they couldn't eat of, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And so one day the tempter comes along, external temptation. The serpent comes along and says, uh, hey, can you eat of all the trees of the garden? Well, she says, yes, we, we can eat of all the trees of the garden. And he said, but we, we can eat of all of them but one. For the day that we eat of it or touch it, we shall surely die. And he says, God's lying to you. You won't die. You won't die. And so then she looked at it. See, he brought it up. External brought it up. She looked at it, and it was pleasing to the eyes. Oh, boy, there she goes. Uh, and she saw that it was good for food. It really looked juicy and tasty at the moment. And then she knew that it was good to make one wise. And the serpent says, you see, God's withholding from you. God knows that if you eat it, you'll become wise like God. You'll know good and evil like God does. You'll be like God if you eat it. Now, internally, it's pleasing, it's alluring, it's enticing. She took it, she ate of it, and gave to her husband, and he ate of it. Immediately, their eyes were opened. They knew that they were naked. They covered themselves, their nakedness. They hid among the, the garden because the voice of the Lord came down during the cool of the day. And God said, Adam, where art thou? Have you eaten of the tree I forbid you to eat? And they said, Lord, the woman you gave me. <laughs> that woman you gave me, she gave it to me and I ate of it. You see what's going on here? Adam blamed the woman. The woman blames the serpent. Well, that, that, that serpent came along and, and he tempted me. And the serpent, well, Satan's gone by this point. The serpent is 
dumb. He can't speak. He's, he, 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 he just doesn't have a thing to say. And they're all cursed. But here's the whole thing. Don't blame God. We're so tempted to it. God, why did you let this happen in my life? God, whoa, why, why did my test come back negative? I, why did my test come back so that I'm ill? God, why did I get this bill? It's all your fault, God. You're in control of everything. And he's saying here, listen, when circumstances in your life are going bad and you're tempted to within to respond and blame me, God, he says, don't blame God. Don't blame God. Well, why not? I mean, doesn't the buck stop there? It doesn't all back up there? And he says, well, here's why. First of all, God cannot be tempted by evil. You can't entice God to do anything wrong. God is not going to do the wrong either. That's what he says. Nor does he ever tempt anyone to do wrong. So when you've got something in your life that's tempting, he's saying, don't blame me. I am not the one who is tempting you. I never tempt you. I never cause you give you anything to entice evil to come out of you. I don't do that. God does not do that. You see, he allows us to be tempted by the devil and by our circumstances as a test of our allegiance to him. But he himself does not tempt us to do evil. I know that this is so because if you just take Jesus, for example... In Matthew chapter 4, it says after Jesus submitted to baptism by John the Baptist and came up and it says he did that to fulfill all righteousness, it was the right thing to do. What I get from this, as soon as you do something right, you can count on it that the devil's going to try to work in something into your life to get you off track. He's going to. It says then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. Now, the Spirit led him into the, the wilderness, and for 40 days, the text says, and I believe it's in the Luke account, every day for 40 days he's being tempted. Three temptations are recorded for us. And these are external temptations. It says after 40 days of, of and 40 nights, he was hungry. Guess what? 40 days of fasting, I would be hungry too. <laughs> In fact, the longest fast I've ever done was a 10-day fast, 10-day. And it's amazing. You know, after a few days, your appetite's just gone. You just, it's gone. It gets a little easier. And, uh, I mean, I could go out to dinner with friends and have nothing. And you think, well, wait, you haven't eaten for five days? Yeah, I mean, that's the way fasting works. He'd been fasting for 40 days, but by that, <clears throat> by that time, he really is hungry. <clears throat> and what happens says that the, the devil came to him. And he says to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Hey, you're hungry. <clears throat> the word if is literally in the Greek, sense. It's a certain class of condition. It means he's acknowledging, you are the son of God. Command these stones to become bread. You see this? He's appealing to his natural appetite. It's normal to become hungry. But Jesus was in a fast. And it says at this point, it says, it is written that man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. First thing I notice about temptation, your best defense to temptation is quoting the word of God. No matter what your temptation is, you find a verse and you refute it. In my younger days, I was a pretty angry person. And I was really trying to work on my anger. And so I started memorizing Bible verses about anger. And there's a verse that says, man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And so when I start feeling the anger coming on, I would quote to myself that verse. Man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. And then I back it up with Proverbs. It says, the fool gives full vent to his anger, but the wise man keeps himself under control. 
Do I, do I want to be a fool or do I want to be a wise man? You see, what, Jesus uses Scripture to defeat the temptation that is arising from within, even though it's normal to have an appetite. And he could have said, well, I can just go ahead and Eve, eat. I mean, after all, I, I've gotten my 40 days in. But he doesn't want to put himself under the authority of the devil. He goes on, because Satan never gives up. You know as soon as you respond to that temptation, he's going to counter with another. And that's exactly what happens. He says, well, come on, since you are the son of God. You see, he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple. It's the highest point that looks down on the Kedron Valley. He took him up to this place in the temple. And he says, hey, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down because God's angels are going to take care of you. And, and this is a normal appetite for life. We want to live. Nobody says, uh, gets up in the morning and says, let's see, how many creative ways could I figure out today to kill myself? <laughs> That's just not normal. The normal appetite is I will preserve my life at all costs. This is a normal appetite to live. He's got him teetering on the pinnacle of the temple and saying, hey, just throw yourself down. And Jesus responds again with scripture. It is also written, do not put the Lord your God to test. I don't throw myself in the way of temptation and saying, okay, God, you've got to figure out some way to bail me out. If I know that something is alluring to me, I, I don't put myself in the path of that. If I know that I've got a problem with internet pornography, I don't sit in front of my computer without some self-controls going on. You see, I don't put myself in the path of my temptation. Jesus said, you don't put the Lord your God to test. And so he takes him to a mountain. He shows him all the kingdoms. He said, all the kingdoms of the world flash before me. He says, listen, I will give it to you. I'll give you all of this. If you will bow down and worship me, this is the appetite for success. I know no one this morning got up and said, I want to be a failure today. You don't wake up that way. It is normal to want to succeed. I have a normal appetite for success. But Jesus says, away from me, Satan. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You don't sell your soul to the devil. And so he's being bombarded. And every time he responds with scripture, he responds with scripture and scripture. And the devil left him and the angels came and attended him. Jesus, who is tempted in all points as we, according to the book of Hebrews. And yet he did not cave in on any of them. I don't have to. Don't blame God. You see, the whole point here is God allows us to be temp tempted by our circumstances and by the devil, but he does not tempt us ever to do evil. Never. So instead of blaming God, this is a real big point. Don't blame God when you're tempted or you cave and say, that's a fine mess you got me in, Lord. No, instead of doing that, he goes on in and, and, and the text and he says, you need to look inside. You take a look inside. James says, but each one is tempted when he, by his own desires. You see, I, all, all of us have desires. I have desire inside for food, for drink, for happiness, shelter, sex, rest. I have all, all these desires inside, but that's not saying that the desires are bad. He's saying evil desires are bad. Every one of my desires can either be good or bad. My desire for food can become gluttony. My desire for drink can become drunkenness. My desire for happiness can become hedonism. My, my uh, desire for shelter can become materialism. My, my desire for sex can become immorality. My, my desire for rest can become laziness. It's the motivation behind it. Is it good or is it evil? Is my desire good or evil? He's saying each one is tempted internally when the evil takes over and I'm not controlling my desire. We all have those. He says, look inside. The real issue is how are you handling your desires inside? Are you desiring good and holy things? Good and just and righteous things? Now, consider the process next. The text goes on, basically it's saying, you get an external circumstance, and, and that triggers an internal temptation. It triggers an, triggers an evil desire. 
You're driving down the road. Someone cuts you off. Oh, now the road rage inside you starts to, you see, you got this evil desire. I want to get even. I, I want to teach that guy a lesson. I want to give him the Italian salute. I want to do something. You see? I got this evil desire that pops out wants, wanting to, to get even. Something like that. It says, and what happens then is I'm dragged away by that. You know, the more I, I think of that and stew about that, uh, the more I got to do something about that. It, it just grabs me. It's like I, I, I got a hook in me and it's pulling me in its direction and, and, and I can't get, get away from that. Uh, I just got to do it. I'm enticed by that. He says, at that point, that desire has now conceived, that evil plot has now conceived in your heart, and you just, there's a conception that's taken place here. A new life of evil has just taken on its form within you, and then he says, and it gives birth to sin. What happens? You, that desire, you act out on it. You see, temptation is never sinful. Being tempted is not sinful. Acting on that temptation that becomes sinful. That temptation now is giving birth to the sin. You've done something wrong. He goes on here and he says, and then sin when it is full grown, it, it grows. It goes through stages of maturity. When you don't check that, that innocent thing becomes a habit. And that habit becomes an addiction. And that addiction takes you down. So what he's saying here is, hey, look, there's a process here. You might as well snip it in the bud. Get rid of the evil desire from the get-go. He said, but when it's, when it's finally done, it's gone through its, it's an incident, and then it's become a habit, it's become an addiction, it's finally, it kills you, you're dead. It's over. And now, if you were to go to the Old Testament, 2 Samuel chapter 11, it says that King David, when it was time when the kings went out to war, they didn't war in the wintertime, you, you, only, you, you only conducted war in good weather. All right. So it was, it was that season when kings go out to war. He doesn't go out. He stays back in his palace, and his palace is overlooking. Uh, you know, the, it's, it's taller than the, the other buildings around it. And he's up on his rooftop, and he's looking down on the rooftop of the neighbor, and there is a lovely lady by the name of Bathsheba. Okay, so David has an innocent look. He didn't know she's out there, but she's bathing. The innocent look turned to an internal desire. Ooh, Says she was beautiful. He inquires about her. Who is she? Who is that? He's allured, you see. He, he's caught. He's captured. And, and then it says, it so took over him, he invites her to come to his place. The next thing you know, she's pregnant. Now, we all know how that works. All right. She's pregnant. She sends back a message, I'm pregnant. So now what's he going to do? Well, he moves into, instead of fixing everything correctly, confessing it to God, and no, he goes into cover-up, like Adam and Eve in the garden, hiding, making leaves, hiding everything. He goes into cover-up mode, and he finds out uh, well, who her husband is. And a lot, If you read the whole chapter, you find that he, he has a strategy by which he has the husband killed in battle, so it doesn't look like he's the murderer, Okay. He's as guilty as can be. He's guilty of immorality. He's guilty of murder. He's guilty of cover-up. Psalm 32, Psalm 51, both tell the story of the internal anguish of his soul. He said, I was hard-pressed. It was like God was pushing me right down into the ground. His bones were just wasting away. He's in deep agony. Why? Because he knows he's guilty and God is convicting him of his guilt. He is guilty as can be. Not just guilt feelings, he really is guilty. Finally, he confesses his sin and only when he confesses it does he have any relief. But for over a year that happens, he is totally in misery. And then the baby dies. The baby dies. Nathan the prophet goes before him and shakes his finger in his face and says, you are the man that is guilty of taking another man's wife. He finally confesses, and with that confession, he finally says, blessed is the man whose transgressions are forgiven. It's the only solution 
to our failures. We go before God and we confess because God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins if we confess them. If we confess them. Now, the next thing I think he's saying here is don't be fooled. Don't fool yourself. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Listen, we're, 1 Corinthians says this. These things happen to them as examples. David's life was an example. And they were written down as warnings. Warning, warning. They're warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. All those things, they're just old stories. No, they're not just stories. God is saying, I put them in the Bible so you would know both how and how not to live. He said, if you're thinking you're standing firm, that's what David thought, be careful that you don't fall. The moment you think that you're strong enough to handle it on your own, you're on your way down. You've already tripped. You're, you're on the way down for a big crash. The following verse says this in 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. Everyone is tempted. Everyone. Everyone. It's universal. Now, it is individual. It's got here, you, you, you. There's a couple more I didn't underline. You, you. Every temptation is yours individually. But everyone receives temptation. So it's universal and it's individual at the same time. I notice in this passage it says, and it is going to happen. When you are tempted. Not if it should happen. But when you are, sooner or later you're going to be tempted. Most likely sooner. It's just going to happen sooner. We go on in this passage, and it says, God will not let you be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. He limits the temptation. Nothing externally or internally can arise that has not been limited to the place and the level where you are at in your spiritual maturity. He's controlling it so that you don't have to cave in. Because he always provides a way out. This is so important. There's always a way out. When the door is shut, the window is opened. He always makes a way of escape if we're willing to take it. The way of escape Jesus took was he quoted the scripture every time, every temptation. Boom, he hit it with the scripture. He hit it with the scripture. He hit it with the scripture. He says so that you can stand up under it. You can bear it. You can overcome it. Now, you need to take the way out. Joseph did. In Genesis 39. Joseph was uh, betrayed by his brothers. He sold into slavery. And bought by a guy by the name Potiphar. God's hand was upon his life. And everything that Joseph did, God blessed him. And, and things were going great for Joseph, even though he was a slave, the head servant in the household. Uh, Potiphar's wife saw that he was, the Bible says, a handsome young man. And he had a really good body. I never had that problem, either one of them, a really good body or a handsome man. But he was. He was a handsome young man. He, he had a, and, and she wanted him and said, come, lay with me. And he says, no, no, how can I do that? How could I sin against God and, and against my master? And so he would flee. Well, one day she makes sure all the servants are out and it's just her and him in the house and she grabs him and says, come lie with me. And he says, no. And what's he do? He flees from temptation. He leaves and she hangs on to his cloak. And so as he leaves, she's screaming that he has raped her and he's falsely accused. He's thrown into prison. Listen, he did the right thing. He fled temptation. Fled temptation. The author of Hebrews says this. Chapter 12, verse 4. You have not struggled with temptation yet to the shedding of your blood. You know what? I cave so easy. I, I am so embarrassed when I go before God. Some people shed their blood resisting temptation. And I caved. I caved. I caved. And I confess, say, God, forgive me of my sin. He's faithful and just. He forgives me. He fled 
He winds up in prison. While he's in prison, he interprets two different kinds of dreams. Because of those dreams, later Pharaoh needs a dream interpreted. He's called out of prison to interpret that dream. And because he interprets that dream, he's set to second in all the land. You see, whenever I humble myself before God, God lifts me up. When I flee temptation, and was, everything looked like this was the wrong thing to do. Look, everything got worse because he was trying to resist temptation. It just compounded itself in a worse way. But God lifted, he used all those circumstances to lift him up. You take the way out. Joseph did. Joseph did. The next thing you got to do is just believe God. God is good. Every good and perfect gift is from above. Even being placed in prison for taking a stand, God turns that all around, works everything together for good. Every good and perfect gift is from above. It's coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. L listen, he said God is immutable. He never changes. It's not like a, the sundial. And some of you have noticed the sun has been moving here. <laughs> and uh, the choir had wished it had moved before they were singing. Yeah. He said God, God is not shifting. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is good and he's only good. And when you're in temptation, don't blame the evil on God. The evil's arising from it within your sinful nature. You need a new nature if you're going to combat the sin. God has only got a good nature. He's holy, he's just, he's pure, he's light, he's good. So don't blame God. Believe God is good. You see, and you do have a new nature. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a new nature. Only you can conquer the temptation if you have a new nature. Uh, notice what he says here. He chose. God chose. Sometimes we think we chose God. The Bible's very clear. He chose us. He chose us. That's very humbling because the Bible is saying, if, I did not, if it were left to me, I would not have chosen him because I'm such a sinner. I would always chosen, not God. So God intervenes and he chooses me. And he chooses to give me a new birth. Give us birth. Remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know your teacher come from God. You're doing these great miracles that only God can do. Uh, and he says, you must be born again. Whoa, where'd that come from? He just cut right to the chase. Come on, you're a theologian. Let's get, get right down to it. He said, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time in his mother's womb? And Jesus said, oh, no, 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 no. That which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. He said, you need new birth. God chooses to give us life, new birth, to give us this birth, a fresh start on life, so that I can make right choices. It says he does that through the word of truth. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, the words of Christ in this book. No one has ever gotten saved without the revelation of God. That's why we send missionaries, take the, the gospel to people who've never heard. That's why we do missions, without the word. Because God not only has only chosen salvation for us to be saved, he's chosen the means by which it will happen. That it would be through the foolishness of preaching that people would accept the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, blessed are the feet that take the good news to those who haven't heard. That's why we have a missionary enterprise. We want to reach out to the world. It's our responsibility. We've got to go and tell them so that they can believe. Then he says that we might become the first fruits of all he created. First fruits means that there's more coming. There's going to be more. You see, salvation, there's more to salvation than just being saved from the penalty of sin. When I was eight years old, I called out on the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Savior. He saved me eternally, forever. I am eternally secure in Jesus. I'll never lose that. It's called everlasting life. It doesn't take a great theologian to figure this one out. If I received eternal life, then I couldn't lose it. If I could lose it, it was never eternal life. I, must, I, I might have had something, but I didn't have eternal life. Because eternal life cannot be lost. Not by me, anyone else, by God. No, nope. if I have eternal life, I have it. There's more 
than just being saved from the penalty of sin and having eternal life. There is so much more. In this passage, it says uh, uh, that, as we're going to pick it up next time, there is the fruit of being saved. The fruit of being saved. And part of that fruit of being saved is, I can overcome temptation in my life. I can defeat the evil desires in my life. I don't have to cave in. I have a new nature. I can walk like an, a believer. I can walk like a righteous person. I can live holy and just and pure. I don't have to cave in. That's all part of being a new creature in Christ. A faith that works when you don't seem to measure up is our topic next week. Because you're going to say, but I do cave in from time to time. I don't live that life. You're going to need a faith that works when you don't seem to measure up. So what do we take away from this today? What do we take away today? First of all, I can overcome temptation. If I know Jesus Christ is my Savior, I can overcome temptation from without. Now last week I told you about my temptation, my test, my trial with my old car. And how I actually wanted to get a gun and shoot it. <laughs> that must have been an evil desire arising from within because of external temptations outside. But I could also overcome that pressure from within to do the wrong thing. It doesn't matter if it's food. I can keep a diet. I can. If it's drink, I can be sober. It doesn't matter what it is. What I should take away from this is I can overcome any temptation. The key is, do I want to? See, often a person will say to me, well, I just can't. And I'll say, oh, yes, you can. Bottom line is you just don't want to. A person who has a fear of fire says, I can't. I, I, I could never run into that fire like a fireman. I, I, man, I just I can't do that. Let me tell you something. If your child's in the fire, you're going in. Why? Because your want to is greater than your ability. When I want to, I can overcome temptation by the grace of God. He's provided a way out, a way that I can bear under it if I will just take it. I may need to quote the scriptures. I may need to re resist. I may, may need to pray, Hebrews chapter 2. Part of praying is, hey, if you start feeling tempted, you just start praying. There's something about that. It dispels the temptation. There's ways and methods that we can overcome if I want to. If I want to. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're asking today that you would put the want to in our hearts. Every one of us has those things that they're impulses within. The rabbis called it the, the yetzer, that, that, that's within, that, that impulse, the urge to want to do the wrong thing. Lord, help us. Give us the want to to overcome that. And say, you know what? The old me's dead. I don't have to do that anymore. The new me is alive. Quote some scripture. Man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that you desire. Lord, help us to battle our temptation so that we too will struggle to the point of shedding our blood. Give us the want to. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. With scripture. More than anything, we need to know scripture. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I call that more to life. There's more to life than just food. There's God's word. We have a study this Wednesday night called More to Life. Everyone is invited. Everyone here is invited. We'll be doing a study of uh, starting points of uh, so many different Bible teachings. We would invite you to be here for More to Life on Wednesday night. 7 o'clock. Father in heaven, we want you to be glorified in our lives. Help us to resist temptation, to refute it with scripture, uh, Lord, to pray, and Lord, to flee so that we don't cave in. Lord, we pray that we would sanctify you in our hearts, set you apart, enthrone you, make you so high, uh, that we depend upon you 
as the way out when the temptation comes our way. Help us, O Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful Lord's Day.